<laughs> wait, 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 wait. All right. So, hello. Um, what we're going to do today is. Got it. Welcome back, Hurricane Adverted. What we're going to do today is we're going to catch up in a very easy going and fun way. The last thing I want to do is a complex computer software and rush through it. Yeah? I did render two videos. Ha! Audio didn't render. So I got to redo a few things. Uh, have them up here, depending on the time. We might just touch it so you have seen it here and I'll fill in the gaps. Um, it's map projections. That's perfect, perfect victim as in get it out in the video uh, because I'm not going to test you on map projections, but I need to expose you to it. Okay. Um, what we're also doing, it's right now 814. Next week, we are going to have our first quiz. Huh? because we didn't have enough yet skills and training on GIS to make this actually a really good assessment milestone. I said, okay, fine, one of the first things we do, we postpone this whole thing, shift it by a week. Yeah? Um, the way we're going to do this is at 8.15 next week, everyone needs to be on a working machine, logged on, you will get a worksheet, we will download data, you get a few questions and tasks to finish. Yeah? It could be as simple as the chapter number two in the book. Make a funny looking map, produce a PDF, upload the PDF to uh, Canvas for grading. Yeah, if it's a digital product. I'm going to test in two different dimensions. There's going to be a setup on questions where you could just say 150 features. Yeah? We are not there yet, so we're going to t talk about this. Yeah? As in, how many streets with the name Maine do we have in Broward County, as an example? Yeah? And you can you run your computer and your database to that. That's something later on. Yeah? <coughs> are you going? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. um, but it's also a mix on, yeah. let's say, digital products, as in, show me how you did this, or these are the settings, this is a problem, get it done. Yeah? We're playing tonight, not tonight, um, today we're playing with um, Business Analyst Online again. There's a search function for businesses and facilities, and we're going to use some ideas and uh, examples that say we are searching all the McDonald's in five miles distance or just on the screen. Hint, 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 hint. I can search on any type of industry listed in the Nike codes, North American industry codes. Yeah? I can look for financial services in real estate if I have that little, like, a zip code number for that Nike code. Yeah? Or I can use restaurants, auto parts, etc. So we are going to do Broadway McDonald's. Yeah? I might ask you in one of the quizzes, hey, let's find Burger Kings. Yeah? Use a tool we trained in class, adapt in the quiz setup, exam setup. Yeah? All right, that all set, let's start. What I want to do is, I want to give you a little bit again, a focus on visual, how you prepare your data and then finan uh, finance, finesse it up, chew it up to um, a little bit more visual appealing material. Yeah? What you see sometimes is, oh yeah, that person really knows how to get all the data together, really understands how to throw it on a map, but it looks like garbage. That's French for not acceptable visual layout. Huh? So what we're going to do today is um, we're playing around with some of the basics of how to set up a visually appealing design. Huh? Pink is not a color we use. It's an 
attitude. Okay? Um, we will see that. And this is a classic, we did bad things. Uh, I started out as in here, three and a half, was it three and a half? Three and a half inch disks. This is your GIS system. And I installed it. Ten piles later, I installed it and I had no idea what I'm looking at. Yeah? So the evolution of learning GIS means sometimes, as I keep saying, like running to a wall 120 miles per hour, smile, stand up, and start sprinting again. Yeah? That little presentation here, we did bad things. It's my idea of you, showing you guys that in the last two decades, I produced a lot of funky stuff. Yeah? But it helped me to evolve and my learning curve, uh, cranking it up. Yeah? Also present work for my best friend. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Yeah? So 10, 15 slides. Every slide has a weird story behind it. We cut this a little bit short. <clears throat> but there are two or three elements where you say, this is a milestone in my personal career and it looks miserable. You will judge me. And I hope you understand why I present this, because it's a learning curve. All right, there's a certain segment we can do. Um, this is how the book is structured. We have a using or making maps. What's the one thing I keep telling you guys? She has this not funny looking maps. <coughs> yeah. So starting today, we're actually going into a little bit here, file-based uh, geodatabases. We're playing with geo, uh, digitizing. I did not pull the file for geocoding, but we'll look at, there's enough theory we need to talk about first before we can do it. And the do it part is super easy. I'm thinking we'll actually do this next week. So we have a little bit more time to have fun and practice tonight, uh, today. I'm sorry that I keep saying tonight, tonight, tonight. It's, I had too much coffee already. Huh? And then here, this is pretty much the rest of the semester when we deal with What's in the proximity of something? Hey, can you show me five minutes drive time? Can you show me five miles distance? Yeah. And hey, it's select by location versus select by data table. Yeah. As in, remember I made this example, everyone with the orange shirt in this room click gets highlighted. Yeah. And we make manipulations to that data. Think about this. Everything, it's a, an object on the map, could be a dot, a point, a line or polygon, we will play with this today, has a table attached to it, like a simple or very complex Excel spreadsheet. And today we crack that can open and we'll see how to do that. Alright? So I spent about five minutes talking about for the next four hours. Good. Map design. I'm running this through. We're just screen capturing that. Just double checking. Yeah. Come on, disappear. So I'm running this through. This is again a little bit of background on um, design. Uh, something you would say, ah, oh, duh, super easy. Yeah, had that in architecture or design before. Um, some of us did not. Yeah, and it's a very simple way to say, hey, have you thought about this? Look at this. Different shades of gray produce different values with different contrast. Makes sense. We have seen this. Every newspaper, black and white newspaper, is using this. Why? Right? Because this is how we do gray tone prints, black and white pictures. Huh? All right. <coughs> with the amount of saturation in here, I can change the contrast. Huh? The end percent to the left is definitely more in your face, straightforward, more massive than the one that's slightly grayed out. It changes different intensity. If I read that map, uh, map, uh, the visual here, this is less in my face. Yeah, makes sense. So, I like that they put up this one there. Bad map, not enough contrast. It doesn't matter what's the story behind the map right now. Huh? We can only see, if you worked with some data before, this is all the U.S. counties, duh. For that, those who have not seen this before, this is the U.S. counties. Yeah. Based on how this, 
uh, field names and all this um, calculation is articulated, it has to be something with the census data 2000 and looks at the share of 65 and older up. But never, not even mentioning here the intervals and all that, that contrast, uh, that contrast here, even in the context here on the PowerPoint, it's miserable. Same map. Different uh, coloring, different setup, and way more storytelling than this one. Huh? A very simple fine tune. You'll see that we get predefined color settings when we go and map design, when we choose symbology. Yeah? You click on it and you're like, ah, 50 different blue, green, yellows, color ramps, and all these uh, palettes. Yeah? Think about contrast. Think about what do I want to tell? There is a story to tell here that in Florida, apparently I have somewhat higher density of 65 year olds, but wait, there's certain blips all over the nation. Yeah? Again, this is percentage, this is not statistically significant in all other hotspots and lows and highs, but just in this way, it's a better contrast. Me and my sink. The big challenge my students always face is taking a lead for a placeholder and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to do two or three maps rather than one and throw everything in. Huh? Think about this. The real world, we are slicing and dicing it and putting it together like a layer cake. Huh? One layer is infrastructure, one is parcels, one is income. Then maybe you have business locations. Depending on the nature of your storytelling and your research question, you might need to make a choice and say, you know what? A site-by-site -site might be more visually important and decluttered than actually all of it together. It's not like that we're going to pay $50 for a, paper, a color, a page printout. Yeah? And we're all doing digital products nowadays, so I'm okay with opening two pages of PDF. Yeah? If they tell a more precise story. So minimized ink comes from the time when you literally sat, sat down and started drawing things by hand. Yeah? Um, that was drawing time, drawing ink. Again, simplify it, don't chunk the whole thing. We had the last, last session, we had this uh, uh, screenshot from New York with all the dots and photos and the metro map. That's the example that comes into mind when I say minimize the thing. Graphics. <clears throat> I can visualize intensity in different ways. Yeah? And you can see here on the top right, just because I put here a outline, contrast and intensity of the story comes into mind. Not always a black outline is helpful. There's a really cool thing we call a halo, huh? where I actually can say, you know what? I'm going to render a white aura, like a halo, from the angel, yeah? uh, around it and offset, let's say, labels from the background of the map yeah? to make it more readable, more structured. Uh, is Halo in chapter two? I think so. At least it touches the touches the um, uh, systematics. Huh? Oh no 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 no! Arc Bro is one click. Yeah, different different there. versions. Different versions. Yeah no, I'm saying in the, in the steps in chapter two, there's a part where they actually to change the city of New York to Halo. The name yeah. So it does touch. On back in back in the old days, in the other software we actually have installed, the other GIS. You had to go to one tab, select uh, select the uh, features, go to another tab, slingshot pretty much from the back end in, and then click Halo. And Arc Pro is on the side, click Halo, big label. So we'll see. All right, again, if you use shading, it's different elements. I can use uh, um, a crosshatch as an example to say, hey, this is, could be an overlay. We do this in Sony. Hazards, wetlands, yeah? that you actually have the ability to look underneath there. Yeah? 
now without changing transparency. If I want to look underneath the light blue, the light blue triangle, I have to change this in the symbology, the so-called transparency of it. Let's say 50%, so it's a see-through. This is already a see-through. Yeah? Different setups. You guys okay with the last row? All right, we'll address that later. All right, so decluttering things. I don't like this one. This is super simple. If you throw everything into ArcGIS, it will pretty much default to some funny looking color. <coughs> yeah? The appealing beauty of, let's say, using ArcGIS online is because if you load up something, Oh, it's already in this nice color set. Everything you want to know. Arc Pro and the other GIS systems, <clears throat> they've got to tweak a little bit a few things and predefine a few things. It's a little bit more time consuming, but it's pretty much making cake from scratch, not a random mix. You know? So, if I look at this story here right now, I have no idea what I'm looking at. Yeah? Bright colors, but What's the important part? Is the grid the important part, the squares or the circles? I don't know. If I change my graphic hierarchies, <clears throat> this tells a different story right now. It tells me that the squares here become part of the background story. It's a way to remember this. This is part of the background story, the environment. <laughs> I would do a campus map and gray out everything because campus only needs to be in place so you understand that we are on the midsection of campus, not on the south side. You know? And the red dots right now tell the important story. Everything else is referencing my additional information. You know? <coughs> Same data, different visualization, different impact on the information you have created. Yeah? On the left, throwing everything, that's data. No information generation process in a thoughtful way has been done. On the right side, I drop the parcel lines and boundaries into a grade scale, put them into the environmental background. Yeah? And I basically said all the crime related data I can use in different color codes and even different icons. Yeah? And boom. I have a different story to tell, and you look at this, and with two or three sentences, you're like, ah, that's crime mapping. Incidents and all that. I can see that. On the left side, it's like, what are we looking at? Yeah, crayons? All right. Again, bad map. What are you looking at right now? What do you see? That's start with her. What do you got? What do you see here? What does it say here? The power of how to read a map. I have a title on the top. What does the title say? Population of cities. So I'm looking at a population map. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. When I take a look here at the legend, to the right and see, okay, here's the city's population. You could do this in a better way. You don't necessarily have to say it's a legend because it is a legend. Huh? Remember the saying about it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. You don't have to put a sign on it and says duck. Huh? So state boundaries is helpful. Okay, so I can see, I look at uh, Pennsylvania. You also can see here, this is the white off a little bit. That's a halo. But I have population in counties and in cities. But my map title says population of cities. Counties is additional information I don't need right now. No? I don't care what else is around Philadelphia at this moment. If I only want to map out Philadelphia other elements. No? So I can drop this and have a different story. If you compare this to this, it makes a difference. Huh? If I want to show counties, what I might do is I just disable the cities in here and have the counties already mapped out. 
and I write two or three sentences to it. Huh? The danger of doing multiple maps, different themes, you don't want to turn into a comic book. Yeah? But right now, these are two different stories, two different geographic units with the same element, population. I can separate that out and say, hey, by the way, we have to consider the hinterlands or the adjacent lands of metropolitan areas, and therefore we present the counties in a separate map. All right? <coughs> Different ideas in color. Again, yes, please. So just to make a few, so you're just saying that you don't want to use more than one. You only want to have one on each geographic feature on each. It depends, and this is part of a learning experience. It depends what you're trying to map out. You will see at some point where you say, there's too much, information. There's too much overflow. If you, if you look at your product, if you look at your screen and say, eh, I just have a bad feeling with this, huh? do a second one. And the danger what we experience is we have those multiple layers and you can enable and disable them with a checkbox. You know, like click on, click off, like a switch. Sometimes you do have 10 different things on your screen for mapping and data processing, but not necessarily needed for the final visual product. Huh? I have done years and years and years of GIS and don't do a physical product because I'm interested in the data, as in data tables or counts. And I'm not interested in a purple versus a yellow dot. Huh? I personally use purple a lot because purple is my editing color. Pretty much if I open a project and there's purple in there, I know I've been somewhere around on the workbench. Yeah? So there are different ways to deal with this. Again, if you think it's overloaded in the early stages of your experience with GIS, it is overloaded. Yeah? Say, worst case, save it as a second project, open up, do a different map. Yeah. There are different ways to organize this, but stay calm. In the beginning, what I want you to, let's say, what I want you to work on is how to get things together and then how to polish them and make them look good. Yeah. The important part is you're able to pull data from the left and the right and put it in your center game and then make, make it look nice. Yeah. I'm completely okay if it's pink, purple, yellow in the first time. At the end of the semester, you shouldn't. You should really go in different gray scales, different color settings. Huh? Again, learning curve. Remember the first time, the first drawings you did as kids with these big crayons? Huh? Well, in the land use site planning class, you worked different crayons and diff different maps. That's a, a way to get better and perfection. Huh? All right, same thing here with colors. <clears throat> Did that answer your question? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> That's going to be a great day. My voice is almost gone. Um, similar like we have seen in the black and white saturation. Huh? If I have a different saturation, I add different amounts of intensity to my color. Huh? So I don't have to do grayscale. I can do this in any color set setup I want and can say, hey, I want to have 50% of red as a midsection of those tones. Yeah. If you've never seen the color wheel, this is the chance to look at the color wheel. There are certain ideas that certain colors will work fine with each other. Yeah. And certain colors are in contrast with each other. Like and white is one contrast. What else do you have? Experience as contrasts. Red and green. Red and green. Red and green. Black and yellow? No. <coughs> uh, so red, green, complementary contrast. Um, it's also an interesting note, know your audience. If you're mapping, if you're visualizing for a specific audience, you might want to make sure that they are actually able to see those colors. Uh, red, green blindness, male, dominant, dominant genetic, uh, um, Disorder? No, component. 
of, uh, of males is red green. At this slide, I keep saying, hey, I don't know actually what I'm looking at. I'm glad that I have the labels in there because I'm colorblind. And everyone's like, what? No, I'm just joking. Huh? Um, but remember that. Those different colors, they will diff tell you different stories. Also, red, green, warm and cold, or red, blue, warm and really cold. Huh? There are certain colors that go with instinct. Huh? Uh, did I have that? This is a repeat. Yeah, by also here, by instinct, I'm looking at this color ramp, I'm looking at this color ramp, I would probably not map out ice and cold temperatures with the red color ramp, you know? Just by intuition, just the way we learn how to deal with certain color setups, you know? Um, fun fact, we see m maps in the political world all the time, red and blue, you know? We associate certain colors with that, certain political schemes with that. Same thing here, we associate, let's say, water versus heat, as an example. Huh? Yes, please. Okay, um, before you were talking about contrast, when you did that uh, population map, and it had uh, the graduation, graduation color, and then it had it by um, symbol. When we change it, like, you know how you have the circles to show the size from small to big? Is it... And the legend, would it be okay if we change different cultural circles? Is that a problem? Like, you know what I'm going at, right? Oh, all right. So he's asking for this. Let's go for back. Visual, right there. He's asking about this. Uh, if you look at the legend right now, you can see that we have graduated symbols, as in with increasing amount of people, we will have a dis visual display of increasing size of our symbol, huh? our, or our marker those green dots. I would not necessarily, because I'm mapping right now, simply population and the size of population, I would stay with one color setup. If I want to go and separate, let's say, two different ethnic groups or religion or anything which is in the same category of population, I might actually go in and say, hey, maybe I change colors, uh, green and yellow. Uh, I don't want to say black and white all the time. Uh, could do two color sets. I also can make the decision, I will use the same layout for the different population. Why? Right? I have, let's say, if I have Asian versus Hispanic, you know, I don't have any more total population what you see here. I would have each share. Now I can map out in one map, Hispanic, and the other map, I, for side-by-side -side comparison, I use um, uh, Asian. Yeah? So again, this is a perfect example for, hey, depending on how I want to display this and how I want to present this, I might have to go different ways. Also, if it's really, really close up, uh, so I uh, zoomed out like this right now. I might get in trouble in terms of giving you the best visual impression and information you need if I have both population shares combined on the same map. At neighborhood level, why not? At this state level right now, a geographic unit at states, probably not I would go for two, just to keep it a little bit more simple. All right. Uh, this was part of the book, actually. All right, let's do a quick overview. All right, so, really straightforward. No? Different percentage rate of color can give me different intensity. Examples are many full. Right. What's confusing? All right. Um, you can see here, I might get in trouble with multiple statistics, with regression statistics, and all that, but I also can use actually dichromatic color scale as in multiple colors combined for a theme. Uh, this is an example of, let's say, a change in forest fires, yeah, where I used a, a, a fishnet or a grid overlay, calculate certain ideas on what was the change over time, yeah, to 
demonstrate, okay, fine, well, we have 30% <coughs> of numbers, 30 or more forest fires in this area, but we also have in, a decrease in here. Yeah? So I can make some strategic management uh, or planning decisions out of that. Yeah? Again, this is the same way when I will say rain. Look at the storm tracker. The way you read the storm tracker is if it's going to be green, it's going to be clouds. If it's going to be purple, you're going to have a problem. You know? There's a certain instinct with these colors. I would, not, I would probably not map that in green and yellow you know? because blue is somewhat a stigma for it's cold. You know? right. Same thing here. <coughs> Uh, I keep saying, oh, you can do multiple maps. This is actually inlet maps, inside, inside maps. If this is Allegheny County with Pittsburgh, it's an example for the book. Yeah? And I could map out the percentage change in housing units. I also can go in and say, here are actually specific sites I'm interested in as a close up. Yeah? Saying, okay, uh, this area here actually shows this side yeah? to make an emphasis on hey this is an overview this is how my region looks and those are the three neighborhoods or three special corners in the neighborhood I'm interested in that's usually very helpful yeah? for those who are taking a real estate uh, market analysis class you just learned an idea of hey if I have to write a report in market analysis I can actually produce a map and say hey Newcastle County or uh, Cincinnati and show on a map where is that place. Uh, let me tell you a story. Let's fly in. Planet Earth, state of Florida, Proud County as an example. Uh, or um, I, this is a pretty much a repeat of what I said already today. Political I did, cultural I did. Um, think about it if it looks not really good to you. Again, this is a stomach feeling. But like, if your friend looks at the screen, wow, and walks back like this, something is wrong with that screen, with your map. Yeah? So I had students who actually would put up extra pink undergrads, good times, and they'd say, hey, Dr. Ritzer, something's wrong with my chairs, and would look up there and like, ah, oh, that's pink. Yeah? So, uh, um, yeah, we can do that. I differentiate in my language in this class between symbols and markers and geometry such as point, polyline, and polygons. Yeah? Why? Because I can put a point on a map, x, y coordinate, lead long, GPS, or a random click on a map and localize that location as in top of the building as an example. Then I can use symbology to visualize this location, that point, as various markers. I can put a palm tree on top of this building as a marker, a red big dot, a triangle, a green circle, yeah? a 3D bus stop or a fire truck. Whatever I have in my library for symbols or markers. Huh? Symbol and marker in this case come together. That dot that locates that palm tree or pineapple, let's make it really ridiculous. Yeah? Let's make it here. That red dot, it's my location. I can attach to anything I want. Here, the, mi the microphone, I can attach anything I want in symbolism for that. Could be a pineapple. Huh? Ridiculous examples usually stick in your brain. So, again, a XY coordinate, a street address we put on the map through geocoding, which is the process to get the address on your map. I can visualize this in different ways. We're going to change symbology and the marker. I need a really clear nodding of you all that you understood this. That dot can be visualized with different markers. Yeah? All right.
Last row, you guys are okay? Good. So, with lines and polygons, it's fairly easy. Huh? How you visualize a street? Well, you give it different setup, uh, different color and uh, patterns. Yeah? Could do a solid line, could do a dashed line. Fine. It's always that dot, that one point, the x, the x y coordinate, that throws off folks. Yeah? So keep that in mind. Pineapples and points. All right. That all set, <clears throat> I can have different pineapples. Yeah? So right now I'm looking at all the green dots. Huh? Symbol, point locations symbolized with green markers. That's the proper language. Point locations symbolized with green markers. I also can say then, fine, you know what? If I actually know what I'm looking at, this is going into the idea of what's to call the crime data. I have a data table somewhere in the, in the back that says it's burglary versus drug dealing. So now my crime incidents with just a simple green, I can open up a category. This is exactly what we uh, had this in uh, Asian and China, in, uh, Asian and Hispanics. This is pretty much a different field, criminal justice, but the same way. Huh? Yeah, you just change the, you change, you change, the symbol. change the attribute and present a different pattern for that symbol and marker. All right. I can do this also again with size. We mentioned it earlier. We saw it in the Pennsylvania and population come map. I can show okay that different uh, every location is shown as an incident, but a certain locations have more incidents. Huh? Not knowing anything about the story, anything else, the research question why we did this map, it gives you some idea where could be more crime or not. Again, type of crime is not included. Could be shoplifting versus murder. We don't know. Huh? Um, <clears throat> this is part of the Save Some Ink. This is churches or lo point or locations in general. It doesn't make sense to get that kind of symbol and that kind of scale of the map. It clutters the map again. You know? Simple points is fine. You know? Simple, simple markers is fine in this case. All right. Same thing here. We can use actually different icons to in show this. You know? Generation iPad made a lot of things more playful. You know? 10, 15 years ago, there was no 3D bus stop I can put on the map. Was a B. That's it. They were got fancy. I had a letter standing there. Yeah. And quick overview symbolizing of lines. Again, this is every time we do something new, it's point, line, polygon. Because those are the three major animals we're going to have now here and we're dealing with. Yeah. Again, different setups. Pittsburgh downtown, example from the book. We can set this up in different ways. Oh, I don't know, I have that actually one. Here again. Um, this are the streets and building footprints. And I show a black outline, presenting contrast on what's going on. So I actually get to feel, okay, this is my built environment. On the right side, I only want to show, let's say, open space, green space, versus build environment. I don't need that detail on building footprint. Huh? I make a judgment call which way I want to visualize and set importance uh, in my story. Same thing here. <coughs> Unique value. Again, that white offset, what's, that's what we call a halo. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I can really clearly identify which are the most geographic regions according to the census bureau. Right. I also can use that and say here in my data table, now we're moving from, hey, crazy Excel spreadsheet into data table, and James mentioned features and attributes. Yeah. So every feature on this map is my row in my table. Alabama, Arkansas, Connecticut. 
Uh, for every feature, in this case state, I can associate attributes like the state name because this is Florida. Florida on the map does not know its name. The data table will say, hey, you're Florida. I can go in and edit Alabama to Mississippi. Mississippi. So this one now will say, oh, Alabama, Alabama here. This one will say, you have a different name. Because I changed the data in the data table. This is the thing we're going to do today with color coding, red, white, blue, huh? and suddenly our dot on the map will change in its color. But again, <coughs> just because I have a name tag that says Mr. Miller, doesn't mean I am Mr. Miller. You know, you go to a conference and you read the name tag and swap name tags with friends. Now I'm Mr. Smith, same guy. Huh? Change my label, change the data at some point. Super easy to mess up. Huh? Again, this shape of the polygon of what we identify as Florida is only Florida on a map when we give it the association. Right now, what we do is we give the association of the geographic regions. Huh? Pacific Northwest. We actually color that based on the so-called subregion. Again, this goes today is about present something on uh, create a geometry, an object on the map, and we add some data to it. Huh? Super simple. Takes time to do it over and over and over. All right, I think we can quit here. Question: And the old GIS we used to have to draw like polygons off. Existing maps. It seems like a lot of that stuff is already done for you in this one. Uh, yes and no. Certain things you would have to still draw out. So the major difference, the way I perceive the old school ArcGIS or ArcMap, we actually have that on the machines here too. Uh, we'll play with this next week. So you get, see, there's a difference in screen setup and all that. The a major difference between ArcMap and ArcPro is ArcPro is workflow oriented. A lot of things are streamlined. Uh, not necessarily loss of detail, but if let's make a drink example. I hope I don't offend anyone. Let's make a drink example. If you go to an uh, airport bar and ask for gin and tonic, it doesn't, you don't have any specifics. You get a gin and tonic. This is the Arc Pro part. Order gin and tonic, get gin and tonic. The old school um, 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 ArcGIS, or what we call now 10.7, would ask you, hey, how many ice cubes do you want? What type of gin do you want? And are you okay with the house gin versus the uh, top shelves? Yeah? So just giving you that gin and tonic sample, you see there's way more information to process this versus click, click, drink. Yeah? Um, you will see that. I really want to show you guys, once we are no, used to the Arc Pro environment, we're going to deal with a few examples on the same example on the other old school software. Why? One is established in the market and the other one is the skyrocketing new shooting star, the new superstar. Yeah? So if you're going out in the field for own consulting work or being hired, you have been exposed to the, all the systems that are in your workplace, and you probably go also, the argument is then, well, you're also the new generation, uh, the new school, the new touch of that software. Uh, uh, I see this with the colleagues in the Oceanographic Center. They're different philosophies, they're heavy data and science driven. They are staying with certain tools in the ArcGIS world because it's so rich in how to fine tune work versus in uh, some of the undergraduate classes, clearly we teach you both. I made a decision two years ago, I am teaching only Arc Bro, because if you approach any data vendor, if you approach um, 
uh, Esri as an example, the question is, what do you want to do with it? If you are looking up for looking data, uh, looking up for data, trying to do reports, trying to do some geographic analysis, this is the tool you need to know. Uh, this is like literally go to the car mechanic and understand. A, you got to do an oil change. However, the mechanic will do the oil change for you. You are not going to do that oil change step by step by yourself. Uh, um, if you're interested in that. I can give you a ton of material and exercises and practice outside of this classroom. Right, let's focus on Pro right now. All right, very quick, some more visuals. There are different ways of visualization and telling a story. Here again, California County's population of 2007. Not really smart separation of intervals, but you kind of get the idea that something is going on in the South and in the Bay Area. Yeah. Now, graduated point markers. We had that. Again, this is a really cool tool that's important. So, uh, multiple slides on this. You can use this, again, maybe not the best way to uh, set the intervals, but you also can see um, this versus this tells me a different story. Makes this look way more dense than it was before. Yeah. However, I can use actually density, normalize my data, and I'll show population on square miles. That's the problem of Wyoming versus the Broad County. Huh? Density. Uh, downtown, downtown Miami versus Westin. Density. Huh? Um, so you can, I can see, okay, fine, San Diego area, there's something going on, LA. Bay Area, but then San Bernardino County. Yeah, do we have a student from that area? What's the other class? Um, not so much. Redlands, California is in that area, as we had yeah. Or I can go we'll use a population dot density, which really shows me okay, there's something going on. If we use this tool, might use it. If you want to use it for your final work, yeah, again, not all the tools you have in your toolbox we will be able to use and touch. If you find a really cool tool and say, hey, I have this idea, I want to use this, let's say popula uh, population dot density, we can do that. Yeah. Again, if you open up the toolbox, hundreds of little tools, I expose you to as many as we have the time for, but some tools. I might just give you a conversation and say, hey, by the way, um, this is a geostatistical analyst. We're not going to do multiple uh, regression in space. No? But there is a tool for that. So you could actually go in and say, all my MLS listing, all my real estate listing points, I can actually run statistics on home prices. Now, Silo does this a little bit with the Silo estimate, but they're, I'm not sure if they actually this exposed how they are doing it. Well, there has been some criticism how they do the comparisons. However, important part here on the population. This tool sets random dots. A red dot here on that screen shows you a population of 50,000. Randomly placed in the county where it belongs to. A dot on this map right now is not the location of population. It's not a city or a town. It is the visual representation of the population in that county. Yes, please. And why have them all scattered around? Because it's randomly placed in that uh, 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 boundary. Oh. Yeah? So, zero population, no dot. One, two dots, three dots, yeah, 15, uh, 150,000. That dot could change. There's a, a methodology behind that. It gives me the intensity, an impression of density without false information of the density itself. Huh? More dots, more population in an area. 
I can randomize this. When we do 3D buildings, I can use that methodology actually to level the building height. Because I measure different positions and I take the average and say this is 35 foot point seven. Yes, please. Wouldn't it be more visually telling instead of randomizing every single nope. dot within the boundaries <laughs> to systematically like equalize every dot within the boundary? No. Nope. Like the zero counting would still have zero, but you would just be able to kind of like patternistically tell each county easier because like some dots are right on top of each other. So. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, different was, story, different message visualized in different ways. No? Right now, this light yellow color has at least 1,700 people, if not 21. Uh, let's see, uh, sorry, this is the um, this population. No? These that are empty on the other map somewhat have still population here. So I can also start lying with maps and say, you know what, there's no one living here, it's desert. But depending on how I make the rule to judge this 50,000, if it's below, if it's only 50,000 intervals, above 50,000 is one, it's a different message. And again, the last slide is I think how to lie with maps. Ah, this is a skip, this is in the book, quantitative uh, skips. Wouldn't the question is to show a pattern of where density is instead of the other ones that actually showing where density... Hold your horses. <laughs> Hold your horses. You and Chase are right now way to the finish line. Now this is about, okay, the different visualization ideas, and we're going step by step through some of them. Huh? Again, hold your horses, don't freak out. Right. Quantitative scales, I skipped that. That's different intervals, different setups, um, uh, quantiles, natural breaks, all that. The chapter two is dealing with this. So please, if you have not done this exercise for chapter two, we are going to play with some of those elements. But as part of this exercise, part of this class, is there are two or three chapters that say, do the exercise. Huh? And some of them are actually connected to the internet. So I actually see on the back end if you have done them or not. And some people have been really active, and some people did not. Huh? The more time you play with the software and explore, here's a button, there's a button, oh, this is a cool function, what's this? Press F1 or the help function. The more time you do this, it will be more easy for you. It's like playing tennis. If you play tennis only once a year, Hello, good luck. It's like playing golf. Huh? If you play every Friday afternoon, piece of cake. If you play every five years, not so much. You're sore for five. I can't, I'm not allowed to play golf, so handicap is too bad. So we'll see. All right, uh, we did this, we did this. This is an example again, how you not should not combine properly, but Again, this is a close-up. This is not any more Pennsylvania, Maryland, or combined. This is a close-up to Manhattan and the Brooklyn area. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So in that scale, I can use two different geographic units and visualize additional information on top of each other. If I would zoom out and have the whole state of New York in this, I would not be able to differentiate anything. Huh? So the scale, how close or how far out I am, is important for your story. And there are certain fixed numbers, one, one to 1,000, one to 5,000, one to 10,000, one to 24,000 is the standard in the US, one to 100,000 and all that. Sometimes 55,000 is better for your extent because you want to tweak it on a page. Yeah? So we play with this. And labels, want to point this out again. Here is a point location that actually shows where that label is. Label here is black with a white halo again. I have different background information. Yeah. And the main information I want to receive here from that map is the boundaries of all these neighborhoods. Yeah. And I labeled them so I know again is east versus west village. 
East versus West. All right. Let me show you what I call we did bad things in the past and then we take a quick break. All right? I did not load that up. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So if I look at this map or sketch, I can see a few things. First of all, it's in German, so I apologize. I uh, <laughs> did not translate that. Um, it says Autobahn. So assuming our instinct, how we perceive ge geometry and features on a visual display. Autobahn, uh-huh, interstate, okay? That line visualizes the Autobahn, you yeah? That marker is the location of a business. It's actually a thermal water spa. Oh, they dig a hole into the earth and found instead of uh, space to put natural gas into that as a uh, storage, they found hot water, mineral water. You know? So they pretty much put up a big hot tub on top of that. That site, this, which looks like some splattered egg, is isochronous lines. Today we call it drive time. In 10, 20, 30, and 40 minutes. And the idea is you can really be fast driving on the Autobahn. Therefore, you have, a, in this case, a north-south expansion of that uh, distance band. Huh? Makes sense. This was done in PowerPoint. That little thing is a visualization of my master thesis. Huh? PowerPoint with a mouse. It took forever. Huh? Um, yeah. There was no sensor, visual sensor in your mouse. It was like an old drag ball, rubber ball mouse thing with a cable. Huh? However, this visualizes the idea of drive time. With a certain distance, certain speed, you can actually, with certain speed, you can overcome certain distances. All right, different project. <clears throat> uh, this is an advanced GIS class uh, project. You can see here, this looks different than from your Arc Pro. This is actually Arc Map. Huh? They have different, now all this would be different ribbons. Huh? This is before Google Maps really, really was uh, in everyone's mind. It was before a smartphone gave you the GPS location in two seconds. Yeah. And it gives you the idea this is a working screen, a screenshot from a work, uh, from a work, play, um, work project, not the final map. But 12 years ago, this was the state of the art. Uh, we built a, a project for a school district for that. Uh, um, but this today would look completely different. Other buttons, other navigation. Again, I call this the iPad uh, phenomenon or iPad generation. Every phone is a swipe on a big button now. Uh, all right, not too bad ones. There are different levels of bad. <clears throat> Path analysis for a new route connecting a school site in Stowe, Vermont. Erin uh, is not here. She might actually know that. She's from the Vermont. She, yeah. Uh, raster analysis with <coughs> slope and population density, um, different roads. And you can see here this insert. I mentioned that earlier. I actually drew that uh, rectangle over there to show this as a close up. Uh, it's a little bit cut off. Um, I did it in grad school. It's one of my first grad school projects in the US. Oh. You will do way better than that. Easy. And you learn how to do this online and on your Arc Pro in front of your computer. I have to zoom in here again. Different ways you could do this in a different way. I would show nowadays actually just one mile and two miles, not these kind of divisions. Yeah. And it's just a mess. All right. When business location affects neighborhoods. Small little project. Focus on this project was actually rendering change, as in you really can shift here elements, attributes, and it will render different locations. The idea right now is this is the demonstration of your GIS work. Uh, it's not a 50 page report, this was one poster or a poster exhibit. Like here, so putting this up. 
crime data in 3D, downtown Cincinnati is a peak. Yeah. You have this one neighborhood overview. This is Hamilton County, this is Cincinnati, and this is the little neighborhood. And then some of the elements here. What I would do different is clean my work. These are screenshots. Like with a sniping tool and all that, copy and paste from the screen, print, and then copy and paste. You can see I cut windows halfway in. I would spend a day, because this was literally a last minute overnight job. Uh -huh. What I would do today is I would have this really cleaned out, not all these little <coughs> leftover boxes from my computer screen. Granted, this was done on like a 13 inch screen. Yeah, today you have the big ones in front of you, different way. Oh, on that note, there you go. technology. If you have a larger computer screen at home, don't use your mini laptop. See if you can attach your laptop to the larger screen. Yeah? Like Brian right now, if you would have that set up at home, I would actually see, say, hey, can you connect with HDMI cable, your uh, tablet, to the big screen? because you can work on this. Think about it, if you cook, if you make a sandwich on a small plate, yeah, and you have nothing else to put the toast and the meat and the cheese, yeah, or you have a nice kitchen countertop where you can lay out everything, organize, and get sandwich after sandwich after sandwich done. It's different. So organize your workflow and your workspace. Get acquainted with these machines because you're testing on these machines. And lastly, everything we do in ArcGIS Online and in Business Analyst Online, because there are two different web pages connected to each other, they are in the cloud. I can use any computer in the world to do that. Yeah? You don't have to come into, physically come into the library and sit in front of a class computer to do an ArcGIS Online project. The reason why I keep saying is at least two or three more times today and maybe next week again is because I un had it, really. I had students who would come into the evening class lab times here when it was an assignment to be done online. They spent 40 minutes driving here. It took a few weeks until they realized that. Great GS work, brilliant personality, but there was this one hiccup because I did not push that button often enough. If we do ArcGIS online, it's online. It's in the cloud. It's like with your music, your iTunes and whatever. Yeah? So keep that in mind. Everyone give me an okay? Everyone still awake? It's 9.15. All right. I'm pretty much done with lecturing then. I got you guys enough teasers. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to skip this. This is stuff Mike did. <coughs> Horrific. Horrific. I think he went on a conference with this. Yeah. Color schemes, green, rose, pink, yellow, all the thing, you don't have to say slope, as a legend here and all that again. Terrific. And he put it back together yeah, and says he has a side probability, but Nothing. Huh? Don't do that. Be structured. Be really, really straightforward. Okay, very bad ones. Don't remind them about that. That's. Any idea what that is? Caribbean. Yeah. It's the Bahamas. Bahamas. Huh? Bahamas. Uh, the Bahamas. 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 This is all Bahamas. Yeah. Um, masterpieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, you would actually, if you want to present this as an overview, where is everything, you would think, hey, this is like Caribbean islands. You would actually want to show a light blue for water yeah, and the island. Uh, this is different. Yeah. So, hmm. Speaking of clutter, this is my master thesis, first one. Huh? Printed on ink, cartridge like $40 a piece. Huh? First generation. 
big, big plotters. Uh, yeah. So what you see here is drive time, blue lines, yeah? different, different intensity, 20, 40, and 60. City of Nuremberg, City of Bayreuth, Wagner Music Festival. Yeah? Um, legend, that's okay, but you could move this actually on the other side so you can see what's going on. Yeah? And the pie charts, remember the first, first lecture, I hate pie charts? This is one of the reasons why I hate pie charts. Yeah? Um, Overly uh, clustered here. You don't really see close-ups. What's going on? This is by zip code, not by community. Could have done this in a different way. Even if I could zoom in, you know, miserable. Oh yeah, that's so by right. Did this here again? This is the location of the. Did this project actually for another side here? paid for the flight to the US to come 15 years ago. Oh. Back then when airfare was cheaper. Um, city government produced map. Believe it or not, this was actually produced by city government. Oh, someone in the planning department knows GIS and put that together. And it was actually some neighborhood in Cincinnati and that's the existing land use, existing land use code and, and just the short abbreviations. Like we can say, state of Alabama is AL. Huh? So in this case here, office would be light blue. Well, vacant is dark blue. So mm. not meaningful in color setups. This is what happens if you throw in data into your mapping system and there's no associated color code. Boom. Do it. Like take a package of crayons and just throw it in the bucket. And like here, pick one. Huh? With no other instructions. Ah, okay, this is uh, same map, different setup. Then, this is the map that paid for the flight. Okay. Huh? Decluttered, only showing the distances huh? along the interstates. To give you an idea, this is the place, the location, and within 15 to 20, 20 minutes or something like this, half an hour, you're in downtown Nuremberg. Yeah? or within the hour, 60 minutes, this is your reach. We have done it last session, all the last, last five minutes. Remember, click on campus and have 20 minutes drive time. This is decades later, the decades before that. Took hours to render, not just a month ago. All right, uh, freight flows along the interstates. Yeah? That's actually a national transportation atlas map. Not really great. Then Mike did this. This is when we talk about projections. There's are three different ways of bending and folding over the earth. Yeah. Really weird projection. This is not how we display the United States. Yeah. That is <coughs> a different level of how to display and then close up. Again, bad things. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of geostatistical analyst. I can use statistics and different incidents and presence. I think this was segregation back then. On let's say ethnic groups, and I can actually now say in that geographic unit, I have patterns where with statistical uh, significance, I have more or less segregation by ethnic groups. This is an example I present here where I show you how to knock the door, how to open it, and put your pinky toe into the door. This is when you want to run a marathon. You know? This is the really cool stuff. Um, if you look at, let's say, real estate market analysis and trends and projections, you might want to consider something like that. Really, really cool stuff advanced statistics knowledge needed. I literally you read up for hours and hours and hours on the statistics. Huh? And then Mark Mondelier, How to Live with Maps, uh, just pointed out that's a perfect literature for Thanksgiving. Yeah? And it will tell you awesome stories how you change the world with just the wrong map. Huh? All right, 
Let's take a five minute break. And then we uh, keep running with uh, Arc Pro. Start recording. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up my system. This is important, guys. Um, important as in we're making a little bit more extra work, but we're trying to be more clean. Remember when I said uh, we work in with our buckets? Let's create buckets on our local machine. Yeah? Um, I'm going to attempt this with the computers in the room. It worked last time I tried it. Yeah? Not sure if the university changed setups. We'll figure this out. In the worst case, we had adopt an overcome. What I want to do now is I want to set up my Arc Pro for local folder connections. We demonstrated very quickly that we can use our Arc Pro and connect into the portal, into the world wide, world wide web. Huh? What I want to do now is I want to go in and say, you know what? Um, I want to localize my data. I want to take control over that. Last time we just said, hey, open up this project, create project, and we did not care where it was actually located. You know? This time, I want to have that bucket. I want to control where I place it. And that's the reason why, it's a step by step, going to use the Windows key and E for Explorer and open up my file explorer. You know? And then I go scroll down. This looks different from your computer to my computer. Go to this PC or local disk. This will look different on your machines at home or here. What I pretty much did is, I also can do this here with File Explorer. Left click here on the Windows, File Explorer, and open it up. Same procedure. Uh, different views, uh, navigation pane, all that. This is part of a Windows system. Uh, again, for Mac folks, this is like your finder. Uh, similar way. We can't use Arc Pro on Mac software. Huh? But similar way to get around. You can see I did class prep last night here as well. But what I want to go is I want to take local C drive. This is how it looks on my computer right now. And that's this. Yeah. So on local disk Z I want to use this function called new folder. Yeah? I say new folder, it pops up and it says in the bottom new folder. I want to call this now GIS class. GIS class. No space in between. Huh? Click OK. And I have a folder down here that says GIS class. Then call it GIS class 2019, aka someone's old data is on this computer. Let's do this. Just call it GIS class 2019, so everyone has the same way. All right. All right. We create on the local C drive. In this case, we can do this on a USB. We can use this on an external hard disk as well. We created one folder right now where we want to put data in. The reason why we're doing this through File Explorer, sometimes a computer system won't allow a computer software to do it. So we're doing it right now with the operating system, and then we come back. Double click on the GIS class, and it says folder is empty. Huh? Let's do another bucket. Let's like put a big cabinet shelf up. Let's put some other boxes in there. <coughs> um, another bucket and call it demo maps. All right. In the folder GS class 2019, I just created another folder and says demo maps. Bucket in a bucket. And since we're doing this already, let's do one more. One more folder. 
and call it digitizing. Digitizing. All right. Everyone feeling comfortable with this? It's completely okay if you grew up on an apple to say, hey, I got this. Huh? So, in a test environment where you would download data, let's say, from Canvas, I strongly recommend to do the same thing. You're going to create a folder and dump everything that you get and work with into that folder. And at the end, we're going to zip this whole thing together with WinZip or compress folders. Honest answer, hands up. Have you ever zipped a folder before? No, other way around. Who has not zipped a folder? Okay, we are going to demo that at the end. We are not going to leave this classroom before you've seen this demo. Remind me about this. Yeah? Somewhere, zip. All right. Good. So, what we're going to do is, I was this huge question last time, so hey, what about finding data in the different counties, different cities? You know? You young man had that question. Broad County, GIS. If I want to do some data with Broad County, where would I go? County website. County website. Ah, can open this up. And I can also say, you know what? I can Google this, Broward County GIS. We pop up with a certain uh, GIS web page. Or we have this already done, so call it BC for Broward County, bcgis.broward.org. Yeah. If I do that, click on this page. I get that one. A lot of that data we can find in different places. This is the first stop you should do if you look for parcel data, taxation data, schools, footprints, everything. How to look for... If I look for GIS data, that's different from, let's say, a PDF report. Huh? So, knowing, okay, this is actually a really cool web page. They give you ideas about GIS, printable maps, interactive maps, comprehensive plan, user groups, resources, and here is the gold mine, download center. Huh? Click on that. And now I have the layer name. Remember, we slice and dice real world into different layers. And now I can go in and load data, download data, from all these different facets. Huh? Address points. Every address point in Proud County is a dot on a map in this data set with additional information in a table in the back. Huh? If I, let's come, we can actually zoom, make this bigger so you can see this. Huh? If we talk about demographics, I have different census block groups and census data does not necessarily mean I have my data attached to it inside. It actually says here, tracks with population data attached. Why? Because one is just the shell, of the, shell the boundaries, and then the other one is actually the large data table attached to it with all the different populations, ethnic groups, employment data, etc. Just because it says, hey, it census blocks, doesn't mean it's actually data inside. Well, it's like coffee cup. You gotta hold it up or open it up to see if there's coffee in there. Oh, uh, what we're gonna do, we're going to take a look at what we have here, and I'll pick a really awesome really weird example. We can do city boundaries, we can city halls, city parks, colleges, all that. I have hospitals on that list. I want to deal with hospitals. No? The part of GIS is spending time with stuff you're not immediately exposed to. 
Oh, but the workflow is the same. So let's do this. I'm going to click on hospitals. Before you click, <laughs> before you click, see the bottom left right now? Bottom left says actually a link that says GIS data zip files hospitals.zip. We didn't do data management lecture yet. The way GIS data is structured, it's not one file only. It's five. But inside our GIS program, it looks like one. Huh? So we're going to do like open heart, not yet open heart surgery, but we're going to do some surgery on our data management. Huh? So I click on this and it should start a download. If it doesn't start a download, you also can right click on it and say save link as. All right, so it popped up, did download. Depending on your installation of browser, which browser you use, you might see this down here, it might disappear. You also might be able to click on this little um, arrow here and say show in folder. Uh, if I do that, depending on how my system is configured, I can pop up and get my compress folder here. And I did download this earlier for testing. Uh, so I have two renamed. Note that there is this like literally the zip from your jacket or your pants sitting there. It is a compressed folder on the computers in this computer lab. I think there's WinZip installed or other software. Channel, channel demonstration on how this works with a WinZip. I click, see here, it's compressed folder tools. If I click on this, different, see that? The ribbons on top change, yeah? I right click different computer system in front of me from you. But you can see all these different options. Yeah? I have different software installed. You might not see WinRAR, which is a compression folder system. The same thing with WinZip. Different algorithm does the job. Yeah? There's also extract all on a Windows system. This is the built-in part. If I do extract all, it will tell me, hey, I can extract this to this current folder location. This is, by, by definition, a standard choice, users, username, downloads in a Windows system. I want to control this. I want to save this only once in the right spot. So, where would we save this? In our bucket. Yeah. So I do browse. And I click here on the browse. Find on my PC, local disk. See all this craziness here right now? This is way in the, into the suburbs, into the abyss. I don't want that. See, we said GS class 2019. And I say demo maps. Select folders. Now, the pathway to extract all these files is GS class 2019 demo maps. Okay? Fingers crossed. If I click extract, it should do something. Oh, right now, I didn't say, hey, show me the files. I go back to sh to my other, f oh, we don't want that, to my GS class, to demo maps, and now I have a bunch of files in my demo maps. All right, if you have not, if you're not there yet, I give you a minute to replicate those steps. Huh? What we did. then you didn't create that folder yet. Makes sense. Yep. So again, re short recap. We went to the GIS web page of Broward County, found the data, the data center, did download hospitals. Hospital zip is actually in my download folder. And I use one method to extract this data. There's another way to do this on a clean installation on Windows. I could double click hospitals and I see this and I could 
mark up everything, drag and drop. Only if you're really, really confident with Windows and your data management. If I miss one of those files, if I do this, all my data will not work. Yeah? I really, really recommend that you guys go the extra route and say, I extract all or use a WinSIP tool on a machine. Laurel, you're looking like right now, ah, I'm not there yet. Okay, on these computers in the classroom right now, there's also a tool called 7-SIP. Instead of you extract all, right click on your SIP file and it says open with 7-SIP. And then you have to extract, that's the minus sign, you have to extract. Yeah? And then we put in demo maps. I come back to you. So, very, very, very important. Guys, very important. You just experienced one very important element. Not every time a computer system that you sit in front is the same. Yeah? So, the reason why I run my own laptop is because I do the screen capture. So, I have the highest, best quality for the videos. Yeah? <laughs> Please, we're going to do this WinSIP operations or SIP operations multiple times. Practice this. The essential deal with data transfer in GIS because we have these little multiple files yeah, is using a compression as zip yeah, and package that. There are different ways to deal with this. However, it's somewhat still industry standard how to deal with that. Uh, because you don't want to download 200 megabytes if it's sipped in two megabytes. Uh, uh, it's coming back from a time where actually the internet was really expensive. Uh, practice this. This can be done in five to 10 minutes. Just open one, rename one, extract, sip, compress, etc. I have not designed yet in the first quiz, but I can tell you, we are going to deal in every session, we're going to deal with the same setup. I provide data or we will find data to download. In 99%, 99% of the time, it's gonna be a zip file. 
This is like here is a bagel or hamburger. It's wrapped in paper. Unwrap it. Huh? Eat the burger. About time. Huh? So think about that. This is one little mm -hmm. more tool. Huh? I understand. I last year had uh, a college graduate never ever be in front of a PC. Double click and win zip. Well, new world. Uh, that's the reason why I'm doing this exercise. And I understand the seven sip here is not as easy to understand as just a right click extract all. Uh, you have to do one or two more steps. You need to be masters of these two or three steps. As in right click on it, juice seven sip uh, as a software installed here. It could be WinSip or WinRA on my machine. Uh, and then extract. I freak out about the menu because it actually has a minus sign for the extract. But you actually extract. You actually blow up things in volume. Uh -huh. Test this. Play with this. This is important. Then also, not every machine you sit on this time will be the machine you are sitting on next time. So make sure that you do data backups. Use B drives is good enough. I try to package data in small portions. I teach you the workflow. I don't have to show the whole universe just to show you one moon. Yes, please. So you can't, um, seven, seven zip can't be replaced by another, by something else? Like, I can't do it a different way? So we're doing, after this today, all these computers are going to be wiped and we're going to put a new GIS system on there. Uh, want, did not want to do that last night because I teach class. So I can ask if we can get rid of WinSip in here. Uh, sorry, the seven zip in here. But again, it's two more mouse clicks. I'm not really seeing a technical challenge. It's just practice, as in, hey, right click on it. Huh? So you can just copy and kind of paste Yes, you can. But the different ways. I can just double click on this and copy and paste. Huh? But I also want to show you at least one or two more different ways to do things. All right. Ready for a hurricane? Okay. Where we find data? Well, in case you haven't seen that web page, National Hurricane Center, NOAA.gov. Huh? NHC.NOAA.gov. Huh? When I had the idea about this guy, this guy was sitting down there. Huh? So if you do this, click on it. We have seen this web page way too often in the news or on your own computer in the last few days. Uh, I can click through all this and I'm interested in one thing. I want to go to Warnings Cone Interactive Map. All right. Welcome to the National Hurricane Center. All right. We have seen this before. What I'm going to do is now I click on Dorian or I go down here. This is how I do it usually. Click on Dorian and get the example here for the current hurricane. Huh? And I'm go skimming through this. This is the regular information. And I'm like, ooh, look, interactive map. This is a GIS class. They're dealing with GIS data. Let's see what we can do. And like a six-year-old, I click on this. I get all the different information. I have a mapping window. I can zoom in with my wheel and get all this. What I see right now is a background map that gives me information on the environmental location. I see here, based on the legend down there, where is a hurricane watch in place. This is the track line for the hurricane, if I scroll up uh, out again. And the cone of uncertainty. Huh? I also see one thing. Download GIS data. This is like, hooray. Huh? So, a little tiny link on Hurricane Do Dorian's interactive map. Down there says download GIS data. I click on this and you can see the National Weather Service and the Hurricane Center are using .zip for zip files.
Anyone got that page? Yeah? John and Kenny, you guys got this too? Again, different web page, different agency, same thing. I found data in SID files. Now I can pick one and download it. That's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do anything will work. We're going to do the one here on the top. Yeah. Simply click on it. Boop, it did download. I do the same thing. Go here, open or show in, show, show in folder. This is my download. Again, I extract my data. There are different ways to do this. Right click on it. I do extract all, you will do 7-zip, extract. Huh? I have extract all. I did the, 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 the top level, top example. Yeah, this is an exercise for find data, download data, extract, and then play with it. If you pick, if you pick something down here, same process will look different a little bit. Yeah. Again, I want to take control where I save my data. I want to make sure, that, speaking of making sure, yeah, we're recording. I want to make sure that this is going to be in my folder demo maps. Okay, I do browse. I find my C drive. I find my GS19 class. I find my demo maps folder. Double click. Select folder. I can type this in if I want to. Just highlight it, clear it out, and type it. Be aware if you do typos, it will save somewhere else or error out and tell, tells you, ah, I can't find a location. So those two extra mouse clicks help. And I do extract, and I go back to the uh, demo map spot folder. Huh? And now I can see even more craziness here. That's one reason, Amanda, why I not don't want to do double click, copy and paste. The chances that I will miss a file and then the system doesn't work and I panic are too high in our level right now of experience. Yes, please. And sometimes when you copy and paste, I realize, especially with GIS stuff, some stuff you cannot transfer over. Yeah. Miss yeah. We can do that next week. I can show you guys error, how to error trap that. It's painful. And we're moving into databases, not just simple shape files. These are so-called shape files. Yeah? Databases are even more complex. There are hundreds of thousands of files inside a folder. And it's actually a database managed with the GIS. If you miss one or two files in there, you cripple the system. Yeah? We are going to do open heart surgery today with our data. So we need to be very particular about where we place things. Uh, and naming convention. I don't really try to do spaces in paths for this exercise because it might not work with one space, two spaces and all that. All right, so right now we did download two data sets. Uh, well, we have no idea how this looks like. File preview doesn't say anything. Uh, this one actually says something, but we don't really know. Look, we can't visualize this as a map. Let's let's open up something software like that opens and deals with maps. Arc Pro. Fire up my Arc Pro. Again, this looks slightly different from uh, my machine from your machine. I'm already logged in, I can sign out. So if you sign in on these computers, you might actually see this login screen right now. Which account do I use? Okay. Uh, we did use Fritty Schiller last time, did we? Okay. All 
Right. Rain down, lock in with the admin. All right, so what I'm going to do is I start a blank new project, yeah, from a template. And now I have a location I can choose. Yeah. I'm going to use one of my buckets. I'm going to call that uh, map layout. Yeah. And I choose the following location instead of users and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say, I'm going to go to my C drive, going to GS class 2019 and click OK. All right, one question. Did you click on um, blank or did you click on map? Map. Okay. Blank okay. templates map. Map layout, create new folder for this project. It does create a bucket and I say it's GS class 2019. Okay. I'm having a, I, I was having an issue. I was waiting to watch yourself. For some reason, the folder that I created, the dust folder, it's not popping up when I, I can find it on the computer, but it's not popping up on GIS. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you don't see that folder right now, F5 is your friend. F5, the F key, F5, yeah, is refresh. Sometimes you just have to hit F5 to get refresh. Yeah? And but da I can see all the trees in my forest. All right. So I click OK. It creates the project. No, just in GS class 2019. All right, let's do this step by step. Again, Arc Pro on my machine might look slightly different because my map is here. I, you might not see the great feature yet. All this, yeah? I can mess around with things. I can reset. You. Yeah. Let's change its name so it looks similar for you guys. All right. So this is in my Arc Map, uh, Arc, Arc Pro. I'm going for demo purposes. I'm going to switch back to my Windows Explorer field, my File Explorer. In my folder Demo Maps with F5. Sorry, GS class. I have now a folder that's called Map Layout. Yeah? Arc Bro did generate that folder for me. In here is all the data and management done for my project called Map Layout. It literally says here on type ArcGIS project file. See that? Inside this folder map layout is pretty much everything I do right now here on that screen. Huh? Again, the textbook helps you to do these step-by-step -step exercises and some are the same way. You set up a folder, you put data in, you open up and you work with it inside. Okay? 
how do we add data to our map? Yeah, not really. Map, add data. Yeah, I can choose different locations. If I say add data to the map, clicking here on the plus sign, it'll pop up. I'll make this bigger here so you can see. Portal is the internet connection. I can look manually for the data here. Yeah, let's do the first step manually. Go for GS class 2019. And now I go to the folder demo maps. Again, this could be anywhere on your computer, USB drive, external hard disk. I'm pulling this manually in right now. Demo maps, all up. Now, this looks different from what I have seen before. If I look at demo maps in my file explorer, um, let's move this out. Look, I have hospitals. All of this is hospital, 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 hospital. I have one hospital here. Why is that? It's because one side is data management and files in your windows. And what you're looking at right now is within your GIS. Okay. I'm going to take a look at here at this data as well. Let's do the hospitals. I can see there's a dots on there. So there's a point data. And it takes a moment and ta da! Pops up on the map and gets me the hospitals. Everyone got that? No, I got it, but I just got a quick question. I got, a, I got mine up, but for some reason for mine, the hospitals were white, like the dots. Yeah. I can't see it. Well, what I, did I say, tell you in the beginning? Whenever we add data to the system, the system randomly chooses a color setup. Yeah? <coughs> so in your case, it's white. My case, it's like greenish. I can zoom in. Let's see, yeah, greenish. Yeah. So the different ways to change this, I can double click on it and hope I, it pops up. Or since we have ribbon systems, double click helps. I can say circle number three, close. Double click it. If I have a so-called single feature symbology, I can double click this and deal with this. What if there's not a dot under my hospital? Well, then why don't you click here on that little arrow? Okay, if I want to do this in a complicated way, I'm active on the hospital layer. I can click here, you can see feature layer, I have highlights here. I can do the appearance change, yeah? symbology, and go through all these exercises. Single symbol, pick, go even more details. Yeah? Double click, get all these elements. Yeah? Again, I can do bus stop. I can search for this. Symbology, yeah. I can do, yep. I can change this into a bus stop. It says bus stop it's in 2D. Now you're looking at the locations of hospitals in Broward County, but they're symbolized as bus stops. So if Alec would walk into this room right now, he's like, oh, we're doing transit stations. Huh? So be precise what you want to display for, let's say, markers and symbols. Okay? I'll let you play with this a moment to catch up. Everyone should be able to at least change this once or twice. There are different ways to change your symbology. The textbook chapter that was due today, actually for last session, is exactly doing this. Step by step, screenshots, 
add this, change this, click this button. Huh? I will not be able to get through all these little items with you guys. So if something comes up and says, hey, let's do this chapter, prepare for it, you got to do it. Very important here, navigation around the software. Be familiar, play with the ribbons. Take a look, what, where's, what do I have in edit, what do I have in analysis. I talked about toolboxes earlier, remember? Give me a moment. Well, be nosy and say, oh, what's behind toolboxes? Look, hundreds of tools are picked on the geostatistical analyst. Hundreds of tools you can use. The only reason when you, the only reason to get exposed to this, or the way to expose to get, uh, ex get exposed to this, is you gotta be nosy and say, hey, what's behind the spatial statistics? What can I find in, let's say, mapping clusters? Who? Ton of little tiny tools. In the online world, a heat map. Well, there's a heat map function in here. I need to find that. Uh, be nosy about it. Play with this. When in doubt, I have no idea what it was a hotspot analysis. I hover over, it pops up with this little box. If I really want to know it, I double click it, loads the tool, takes a moment. A lot of input, but help button. Connects to the internet, gives me a whole rundown on the tool specifics with the statistics in the background. Yeah? So be aware of that. JS is not your enemy. It's just a very misunderstood software you need to talk to. Be playful, navigate around. Yeah? If something happens, uh, you gotta be playful with the view here. Uh, there are different things, like catalog view, catalog pane. I can open up this, that's different. Uh, we're going to do this in a moment. Uh, the ribbons on top will do change at some point. I'm not here to make your life miserable, but at some point in session number six, I will not be able to tell you how to add data. We say add data, map, add data. Done. Huh? This is like opening a door or closing the door when you leave your apartment. That's routine at some point. How do you learn routine? Again, golf example, driving wrench. If you want to better your drive on a distance, on a three iron, three iron, yeah. Then you are going to do driving range and bucket after bucket after bucket. You are sore, but you actually hit that spot. So I really can urge you guys to practice this. Huh? Why? The less time I spend on searching the function, I can use more the time for using and producing. Huh? So if I have to find five attempts where to add data, I'm losing time. I go into panic mode, I shut down, and the result of that, half an hour, 35, uh, 45 minutes testing time is gone like this. You know? And on my worksheet, no work is done. Please. It's driving a car, driving a bicycle, you know? practicing sports, running. You gotta walk, run the system. You're not doing run marathons on this machine, but basics we need to get in place. All right. So, have you changed the symbology yet? All right. Pick some random stuff. I'll use the search function for symbology. Red square, blue square, etc. Any questions? Yes, can we manage this later? I oh, yes. There are different ways to set up a symbology. Yeah? Um, different systems, uh, different style libraries. Um, on, this, on this install, I don't have the 3D right now. Yeah? All right. Yeah. 
Got this? Feeling okay with that? So this is one way to deal with add data. Huh? As in add data, click on this one, manually go through this and find the data I want. Huh? What if if I want to see more about the data? Huh? What if, if I want to see if these are lines, polygons, or points? What if, if I want to see, hey, is this the state of Florida, or is it the state of Alabama? Huh? If I want to explore my data, I need to be a little more complicated in life. Let's do this step by step. So you can see here right now, I don't have what we call a catalog. Huh? So I go to view, and I go and open up my catalog pane. Again, if I keep my mouse over this, it actually tells me what to expect if I would click on this. Huh? Really cool thing is Python, we're not going to do this, but point out fun stuff. Catalog pane. Huh? And I, in my computer right now, it popped up like this window. I can dock it, you can see this. I can place this anywhere I want, and I have those pilots popping up. You know, the bluish stuff is pilots. So I put this here right now. Actually, let's keep it open. No. Here we go. Catalog view. Let's do it with catalog view. It's different. <coughs> Again, insert on. When I'm looking here at my map, I want to switch to catalog view. So I get this set up here, catalog view, because catalog view gives me here the idea to preview data. I can look into that. Huh? Like an X-ray machine. Uh, how do I got there? I was in map. Here on the map, I go to view on the ribbons, and I take catalog view to set this up. All right. So it has different options here. Right now, it says project has databases, which database layout GDB Geo database. Huh? This is the software, the system my computer is managing for me right now. Yeah. But I also can see here there's metadata. Everyone loves metadata, but no one fills it out. There's geography. I can take a look later on whatever is displayed in there. And I can take a look at table. Remember, point, polyline, polygons. This is how I do the geography. 
And then yellow, blue, and red as the color code for my points, my locations, would show up here in table. Yeah. You're cool with that right now? So we are catalog pane, the uh, catalog view, open up this, and we can take a look here and browse around. If you remember, we had portal, my content, and I have all my different projects um, from the online world. Yeah. So why am just clicking on Oh, okay. Yeah. Look, little button. Chase, little button. Little button. Yeah, you're on the right. Ah. Yeah. Um, Are you in catalog view or ca uh, ca uh, catalog pane? Catalog pane? Yeah. No, catalog, catalog view will give you the red view. Gotcha. So even oh. though I'm here, it looks the same. It's not that sure. Yeah, because there's no data. Yeah, Let's take a look at this. Let's connect the folder. Again. If I go here to contents on the left side, huh? I can see different setups. I have maps, multiple maps if I want to. I have my toolboxes. This map layout TBX was done by the computer for me in my project. It automatically does that. Uh, databases, automatically done. No? Styles, I can prepare a few things. Here's my 3D. Andrew, I would look here for the 3D stuff, for symbols. No? And I have folders. And in folders, right click is your friend. I click on here, right click, and it says add folder connection. So anywhere in the system of my computer right now, I can make a bridge and a connection. Yeah. So instead of clicking 5,000 times through my computer to add data manually, I make one folder connection and it's mine. Yeah. It's like you would walk to the pool and put your towel on a, on a chair. Yours. Yeah. If you're a mean, mean uncle, you lick your finger, put the finger on the sandwich and says it's mine. I'm yeah. calling dips. Uh, we're calling dips on our location for our data right now. Add folder connection, left click on it, and it pops up. Similar way we have seen this in a file explorer in Windows or in Finder in Apple. Uh, go to my C drive, go to my GIS class 2019, double click it, uh, and let's say point at demo maps and click OK. If done right, demo maps now shows up as a folder here. Yep. Let's do a refresh. Refresh.
If I was able to connect, or when I'm able to connect my folder connection, as again, putting a pinky toe into the pool and define this is my pool, huh? I can go now to demo maps, yeah, folders, demo maps, and I see those four features again, four, four data sets. We have seen this before with the simple add data. But if I click at some hospitals, and click geography, it will actually load my data and puts a background map in the back. Takes a moment, internet connection, etc. Huh? So, so if I were to say in my contents, if I delete my map out of there, yeah. Well, see if I close my map here, I always can find it here again. Button here, slow hide details panel. Do you not even see this one here? Are you in catalog view? Different computers, different machine setups sometimes. Yeah? So if you're really, really, really nerdy, you will look at your computer software right now and you will realize, hey guys, 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 I'm teaching eight hours today. My voice is already gone. There's a certain amount of level and volume I will present and a certain amount I will not go or beyond. So try, if you have questions, we take the break and answer your questions. I will try to have little breakout moments for you guys to play with this and catch up. But there are certain informations I want to deliver to you guys. Class time is short. Huh? I try to catch up with a few of the lectures, giving you a video so you can watch this. But this is important. We had just right now a moment that something looked different here. Down here, look, there are different buttons. <coughs> Laurel had thumbprints, thumbnails down here. Yeah. The software is sometimes tricky that it has those little buttons that are messing up my view. Yeah. And part of learning to be confident with the software is to do not panic if this looks different. There is a reason why it looks different. Number one, user error. Number two, it might be a different version. Yeah. Some of you, if you look, went to, let's say, hospitals, 
had this one here and said view content. Gotta click on content. Doesn't give me the right idea, but some of you also had here on the bottom Brevue. Not necessarily geography and table, but just Brevue. Huh? A preview. preview. For shall. Huh? So next week your screen will look slightly different on these computers. Huh? Gotta adjust for that. Huh? My, mine is the update from three weeks ago. We're going to catch up. Huh? So, nothing to freak out about. If I'm in the catalog view, I can look here, my content, I go to folders, I can see my folder I just connected with demo maps. I click on demo maps. Huh? So right now I'm looking with my chairs classes into that bucket we created earlier and dumped our data. If we have done our data search earlier the right way, still recording this, yeah. I should see four different packages here. One is hospitals. Huh? We did do that. We did use hospitals as an add manually. Huh? Add manually was map add data. So I have points, lines, and polygons here. Let's do points first. Huh? I can see this here on the icon. The little symbol here shows me an indicator of what is what. If I do geography or preview, and I can zoom in and zoom out with using my mouse wheel, give, give, wait a moment, it will take a load. Huh? It shows the locations of the hurricane path, the way they project it, 8 a.m., 8 p.m. Huh? If I go and say, take the line features, draws a line, will load. A mo will take a moment to load the data. Huh? Or I go here to do polygons, and I see that cone of uncertainty. Yeah. This is when I do my brave view for the geography. There's also the option, could be down here as a pull down, could be here the button as table. If I click on table, it will look inside and will show me kind of that Excel spreadsheet format with one polygon, storm name, storm type, etc. Yeah. This is for my polygon, for my dots. Remember, with multiple dots, every dot on the map has data associated with it. Let long coordinates, etc. Huh? This is how I learn about my data. This is now I know, okay, fine, what do I have inside? Huh? All right. How do I add the data? To my map, say take the, the, the cone. Well, I right click on it, add new to map. If you have multiple maps open, it will actually give you the option which map you wanted to use. So you can do one catalog as data management, but you can have multiple map projects open. And pops up different colors if needed yeah this is far this is before it even had its turn okay again here you can see appearance labeling and data if I'm on my cone click appearance there is the transparency I can actually change my transparency slightly let's say 55% now I can actually see what's underneath it. All right. In theory, that folder connection should stay active within that project. Yes. And you did download the data. So this is now locally on your computer. It's not online anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, because we fetched that 
um, zip file and you stored it on your computer. <coughs> Yeah, and I have the preview function. Huh? And uh, I could put this on a network server. I actually can select elements. Huh? So you will see that using this catalog here is super handy when it comes to more complex elements. I also can use this, remember it's Arc Pro. When you log in, you're connected to your section in the cloud. So I can actually now go online and could pull data we did uh, of course, it's not refreshing. Come on, load. I could pull the live demonstration. It's not coming up. Refresh. My content. Here we go. What if you make one? Uh, one one folder connection for a specific project will stay with the specific fo project. Yeah. Yeah. But what we also did, we added demo maps to the. Yeah? So this is your database folder for your project. Well, like how you have data in the portal, so it's like on the cloud, so you can always access the data for any project, right? So yes, if yes. So if, connection, if it's coming from the portal, for, for the cloud, yes. Your hurricane cone right now is local data. Local data. You save this on your computer. It's local. Yeah? If you create something in the cloud, and you pull this in, you're pulling this in for display and work. Yeah? So you have to work that kind of connection <coughs> back and forth. Yeah? All, right. All right, so we have this guy sitting here right now. Yeah? Again, for demonstration purposes, it doesn't matter if these are the hospitals or is this a hurricane cone, or is this a, just a track line from the hurricane? You know, right now, you're putting data into your mapping display. All right, so, chapter number two. Layout. Huh? If I click New Layout, I can now actually create something that I intend to print. Huh? Do letter size, new layout, letter. <coughs> now I get this kind of view we have seen in Word or PowerPoint, etc. Yeah. Just to point out a few things. Here in this ribbon are the so-called map elements. So if I ask you, hey, create a map layout with the proper map elements, we want a north arrow, we want a map frame, we want scale, because I want to know which direction I'm looking at, where is north on my map, huh? and is this a mile or is this 10 miles, if I look at the printout. All right, so I have map number one open, I can actually say current map here, map one. It even gives me the idea of what I'm looking at right now as a thumbnail. Click on this, draw. Huh? This is pop. Hmm? I did map frame. And I, my, I have two maps open right now. Map, my map one is the one that shows you here. This is actually my hurricane. Huh? Click on that. And draw the size I want. Huh? And it's like in word graphics. I can move this around. I can use my. As far as the tab was saying map frame, it's not popping up. Is there a way to add it? It should at least have default. No, mine doesn't have map frame on this. Have you have a map open? Yeah. Okay. Or did 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. The layout. The layout. Top left. All right. So I can zoom around with this again. You will feel a little bit com uh, co uh, comfortable with this because it looks like a Word document. Yeah. All right. Map elements would be a title. I don't care about the title right now. I want to show you the north arrow. Different north arrows, fancy ones, not so fancy ones. Click one, place it, draw a box. Now I have a north arrow. Yeah? Part of making a map project look nice is maybe I take that north arrow and put it inside the map or outside, depending on my style. Huh? Same thing with my scale bar. There are different scale bars. Huh? We are measuring in, in Imperial. Huh? So I pick one that I like and draw it on the map layout. We are in the so-called map layout view. Huh? Again, I can even have different changes here, grids and all that to help me to align with certain things. I might actually end up here in a funky number, 1550 miles. I can draw this in and out to find a way that I like manually. There are other ways I can do this, let's say changing my scale. Huh? If I click here on scale bar, ribbon system, here on the top, I can manipulate all the scale bar the way I want, even the placement in numbers. For folks who are dealing with InDesign and all that, we type in all the time. Yeah? I can change my font size, I can change the style again here on the go. Yeah? the way I wish to move and manipulate. The extreme details on how to make small changes to these elements are in the chapter two. This is one of the I have to do chapters and practice chapters. Huh? So that's the reason why I'm spending very little time on this. What do you mean? Like, like I have the hospitals and I also have the storm. But when I when I create the layout, it's showing like the whole. The whole All right. So I have the trick I did is I have only in my map one. I only have my hurricane. Yeah. I could go in and say I take the hospitals. Come on, refresh for me. I have the same problem like you guys had earlier with a computer. It doesn't take it. All right, let's do this manually. Map one, again, add data. I pull it in manually. Add data. If I put in the hospitals, <coughs> cool. Hurricane cone, hospitals. Yeah. So if I would put in a new map frame, yeah, deleting map frame. Insert map frame. Now my map extent has changed. Now, please, you can see this. Here are my hospitals. Here's my cone. Huh? I can change this with moving in my map in and out. Huh? Let's do this in a break. We're doing a five minute break in just a moment. All right. Adding my north arrow again because I killed the whole thing. 
and my scale bar. Yeah. And I can again manipulate this, move around, set this up. For the most work we are going to do in this class, we're probably just ending up doing work in our mapping framework and end up with data manipulation. Huh? However, hint, 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 for next week, huh? one of the deliverables will be a map layout. As simple as, here's some data, throw it on the map, change its color, huh? make the arrangement and a map layout, save the project. Huh? So practice this. Uh, when you do online work, just a hint, I had students who showed up here for class today who did not log in for the last two weeks. So when we open up Business Analyst online or ArcGIS online, you haven't seen this in two weeks. You can't practice what you don't see and open up and play with it. Uh, be joyful with this, particularly the online part. You can do this anywhere. I can pull out my phone in theory and can do it. Do I want to do this with my big thumbs on a small phone? No. Huh? But play with this. This is a class that depends on your work and being interactive with the software. And the small little modules I push you to play with. Yes, please. Was it a stretch? Yes. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, we've done the main class on our pro. Can we do it all online version? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, there is some functionality, yes, if you share the data, if you publish the data online, but probably no. Yeah? However, this class, the way this class is designed is there is Arc Pro local software dependency and we are moving step by step away from it with different tools. Yeah? So looking at the uh, final project, you can do the final project completely online but it's a different workflow than on the computer itself. I would think it's actually a mix of both you need to do. Yeah? So you can twist around that. Um, and we're going to make sure that we have enough lab hours. I think we have right now every weekday starting at 6 o'clock until about close of the library. And public safety actually and the folks at the desk over there, they actually have, have a list of your names. So if this is locked, they let you in. If you're here at 4 p.m., they will let you in. Uh, my experience the last few years is they call this Thomas's classroom. Thomas' students ask nicely and they're really wonderful folks. Huh? So practice. I know we have Apple users. I'm working on the technology that we could do this virtually, huh? like with Citrix solutions. I'm working on it. Cannot promise this this semester. Huh? So like you have been in my Argus class. Remember we switched the one section of the Argus class was completely virtualized. Uh, so you did not have to sit here in a computer lab anymore. Uh, so we're working on this. This is a learning process as well. I uh, gotta educate folks in the university that have no idea about GIS how to deal with that. Uh, okay. I know we did this touch this only briefly, but if I ask you, create a map layout and add appropriate map elements to the project. You understand that you're going for a new layout and you're putting all these things together. Again, doesn't have to be pretty. Huh? But if there's no north arrow on it, if it says map elements, you gotta show a north arrow. Huh? I was like, go, go and play golf, you gotta bring your golf clubs. <laughs> That depends on your data, because right. so you. If it, look, if it is a skewed data set, and like it's a true north data set. Because you can actually change your angles. See that? 
to north. Let's do this to see that we actually see, see this coming. I right click on my data, on my map frame, go to setup, change by 90 degrees. My north arrow changes with 90 degrees. They're linked. They're part of one system right now. Huh? I challenge you guys, do two map frames on one map. It's a little bit difficult, but it's done right. It looks cool. Two map frames with two different north arrows and you can rotate. Again, this is a very special solution. What if, if I do... I will come and help you with this. Yeah. Map frame, properties, you can see different options here. Again, you gotta find those little buttons. Huh? So this is a very nifty way if I wanna display, let's say, I wanna create a map that is gonna be landscape versus portrait. Huh? Why? Because the state of Florida displays differently on a landscape versus a portrait. Huh? I could rotate this whole thing. Just a few mouse clicks. Look at this. Hurricane right now goes actually going south on the map, but actually too north is too far left. Small little nifty thing. Way too much detail right now, Chase. Huh? I want you to understand just to throw things together and learn how to get a little bit more finesse with this fine tuning over the next few weeks. Okay? Let's take a five minute break at 11 o'clock sharp. We're going to hit more data and more fun. Got to do some digitizing tonight, uh, today. And by the way, save button. Got to save the stuff. What I want to do now is we can kill the layout. We do kill the map. Yeah, I saved the whole thing. I keep both together now. Um, I do both mini projects in one. Yes, please. Earlier, I accidentally closed out the map. Is there any way to bring it up? All the yeah, if you go into contents, uh -huh. you can open up these guys. Just say open. Pops up again. Yeah, this is this is a really cool part um, because you have, it can actually work on different multiple maps combined in different views, different symbology if needed yeah um, not too shabby what I usually do is I have one where I throw in things it could be 10 15 different layers to explore to data mine to work and then I have one new one where I put it everything together to make it uh, look pretty yeah as in this is my workbench this is the messy kitchen and here da da nice plated meat yeah so nobody cares how many knives you did, did the dirty work for unless you see it on a beautiful plate. Huh? So keep that in mind. You can do messy work here as well. And that's also a reason why at some point I will ask you to, hey, you know what? Oh, is this machine beeping again? Random button worked. Um, at some point I will ask you, hey, package the whole project, not just like to create a PDF or a screenshot. Why? Because I want to see what you have done here. You know, sometimes data is underneath it and you don't see it. You know, I could, in theory, I could move the cone underneath the topography map. My cone just disappeared. Oh my God, my data is gone. No. Look here. Drawing order, database or data source order, the different tabs here. Yeah? My data is not gone. My data is just hidden underneath Earth crust. Yeah? Or Oh my God, my data is gone. I don't see my hurricane. There's a button for that. Or right click and say zoom to layer. Zoom to layer. Ta-da. If you put data on, 
and you're like, ah, it's gone. Right click on your data layer, zoom to layer, is your helper. Lots of panic attacks gone right now. Huh? Just because you don't see the data, it's still there. Huh? Uh, speaking of, yes, please. This one? Yeah. Okay. If you zoom to export a full zoom, zoom out, you see how it's show the whole map? How do you, like my map right now on my screen is pulling up a totally different map from that map. Do you have topographic in there? Or do you have maybe a different base map? That's topographic. Now let me reopen it up. No. Yeah. I remember there's a way to change it to the different type. Yeah. So, again. It looks maybe differently, but you have a base map. So the requirement would be present a base map. It's not necessary to present base map number 2500. You know? Again, I can do this mapping work right now with the cone on a map like this. You know? I can change the base map. The streets for hurricane mapping might not be the most appropriate when I show the islands. You know? But actually shows now here the islands and I can zoom in and get actually more and more of the streets then. Yeah? So think about it. Sometimes the context is important. Again, let's say next week, I don't care which base map, but I want to see where that cone would be as an example. Okay, let's do some more fun. So we started out today with data management as in when we, where we find data, we put it locally. What if, if I don't find data, what do I need to do? Make it up. Huh? Next week we're doing geocoding next week, as in type in an address or type in 100 addresses. Huh? What if, if I don't have any data available, but I know it's in the real world? I could digitize it. All right? So for that purpose, let's do some preparation. If I click here on folders and map layout, you can see this little can here called map layout dot gdb. Huh? Don't double click it, just simple clicks. Huh? If I click, give me one second, I explain in, in plain English what I'm going to do and then we click through it. We are going to create now our spatial data. We are going to use the process of digitizing. Yeah? And we're going to create feature classes inside a database. Our pro is managing those feature classes for us. That's the reason why we, when we created this map layout project, it had created this can here as a database. A little silver can is the international symbol for databases. Yeah? This one here. Right click is your friend. If before I get crazy here, yeah, I right click and say new. And just hovering over there, you can see there's different ver things I can add now to my can. Yeah? And I want to create a feature class. It's just a modern fancy name for a shapefile like we did earlier, but it's managed differently. Internal, back office, different people working for me. Huh? Right now, we don't care if it's a downloaded shapefile from the National uh, Hurricane Center or from Broward County. Huh? That's just the old school. This new school thing is uh, 10, 15, 15 years. It manages our data differently. Huh? Gets more complex behind the scenes. For us, it's just a right click. I want to do feature class. One click only. All right. It will look different on your screens. It just popped up here with a wizard. If you want to accidentally exit out of your catalog, have you open back up? Go back to view catalog view or content both will work 
go back to view here in the project. Huh? Alright. Wanna do some digitizing? Let's do points. Let's call this whole thing cars. Cars, automobile. Huh? <coughs> And it goes here through step by step. I don't want to have C values. I don't care. Leave it on. Yeah. But part is that you name this cars and here as type, you need to do point. All these different variations. This is number one trip problem. This is if you create this at home here in an exam test, this is easy to oversee and trip over. I want to do points. Okay. How did you get to the class? Right click, <coughs> new feature class. Then I click next. Here on that screen, it will ask me what type of fields I would like to enter as in this is a blank excel spreadsheet let's name some cells yeah. type in here color all right it says it's type text you could choose different types right now text is fine down here is the length 255 characters used to be a lot of hard disk space. Uh, hard disk as big as me. Uh, you can use 10, 50, whatever you want. Right now, we don't care. 255 is default. Let it be. At this moment, I can click Finish. For demonstration purposes, I go Next. So color, color, text. Next. This is the one I have on my system right now in my project. We can keep that. That's a good default. For the demonstration purposes, it will work. Huh? We click Next. Technical stuff that really confuses us, we click Next. Huh? And Next again, and Next again, aka Finish. So pretty much what we really need to do is add new feature class, name it, select the type, add the fields we want to have in there. We can add them <coughs> later on as well, but right now we add those one or two in the beginning and click finish. In our little world, in our sandbox, that's perfectly fine. All right? So right click, refresh. I need to restart my system. Here we go. It does this. So in my catalog pane, I go now to databases, right click and refresh, because sometimes there's a delay, so you gotta shake it up a little bit. And I double click into my map layout GDB. Yeah, it also shows me the physical location right now on my words uh, my system. If I double click in here, oh look, cars, I just created that. Awesome. Look at this, look at geography. Oh, nothing comes up. Table. Oh, nothing comes up. What went wrong? It's a shell. We have not created any dots, any points into our system yet. We didn't click on the map yet. Huh? So, of course it's empty. It's like here is a book, just a cover. No words written in it yet. All right? That's fine with us. What we're going to do is we right click on cars, <coughs> add to new map. And it pops up with a default view for the map because there are no dots, no points yet, no data yet in our uh, feature class. Huh? 
Remember, when we put up uh, the hospitals for Broward County, zoop, it jumped into Broward County. Uh, because that was what, what we call the map extent. All right. I want to look at a different base map. I want to have imagery. And I want to get to our campus. All right. Very short. We created cars as a point feature class. We had a field in there called color. Open this up into a new map. Like add the map here. Add to map. Or add map to new map. In the new map, I changed to world imagery. Yeah. And now I'm going to find Florida. Zoom in, big lake, zoom in, this is that little triangle cut where 75 comes in, this is Weston, huh? zoom in a little bit more, airport, harbor inlet, airport, lake, 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 golf course, and I'm going to find the university. Training facility, Carl DeSantis building, and which parking lot are we going to take? We take the business school parking lot. Gesundheit. All right. So again, I did zoom out from the big far, far world and I moved in into the business school parking lot. Of course, I missed it right now. Again, small exercise how to navigate around, find the place you're using as a playground. Huh? All right. Everyone found the parking lot? No. You can do any parking lot on campus. It's just easier if everyone looks at the same screen. All right. How often do these maps get updated? Depends on the region. Change to yeah, images as a background. Say finish. That's a quick finish. Yeah. Finish. <coughs> and once this, this is done, go back to map and change the base map to imagery and find the book spot. Hi. You're a little bit too far north. About an hour drive time. You wait now, three hours north. Here. Uh, 
Combat should come. <laughs> Okay, everyone ready for the pocket lot? Got to do this. <coughs> Alright, so, I have a feature class I call cars. I'm looking at the parking lot, I see cars. What do we do? We do digitize some cars. Yeah? So, if I do digitizing, I do editing of my data. Edit, editing. Hint, 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 hint. Welcome to the edit ribbon. Yeah. All variations of craziness. Yeah. I want to take a look at the great features. Remember, it's a feature class. Let's do some fe features. Great feature. I can put this alignment the way I want to arrange my computer, my screen work, etc. Yeah. I could switch off the ribbons, but I keep them on for you right now. This is good enough. So I do cars, click on it simple once, yeah. and you can see my mouse has changed its cursor. Yeah. So somehow my 
like Har's tablet is not a point, I guess but like a layer. Huh. <laughs> Did you choose a different type of Yeah, I suppose I did. <laughs> Yep, you did the polygons. Ah, classic. classic mistake. Remember when I said this is the first big step you can trip over? I tripped over it. Bonus point. <laughs> yeah, why not? All right, so let's do a dummy and then the next step. If I'm here in cars and I see here the create feature and it says template, It says point tool cars. My and it changes into my map view right now. My crosshairs. You can see this nicely. And as you can see if I move around, there's a dot following. Huh? On an empty spot, I click once. And now I can see a small little point. Let me change this to make this really, really big. Yeah. The reason why this one is blueish is because my current selection. Oh, we get to that. So I just created a, a point. I save. Here's an edit session. There's a save button. If you don't save once in a while, you lose them. If you click 20 dots, 20 cars, you don't save, you close everything, don't save, it's gone. Yeah? This is open heart surgery. You don't mess that up. You can easily lose hours of hard work if you don't patch up the patients once in a while and save. Yeah? It's like in your work. Word has an auto recovery every 10 minutes or something. Huh? You can even go into two minutes if you change that. All right, so little buttons, little secrets. I'm clicking on this one, it says open the active template pane to specify attributes. <laughs> huh? And it says color is null. It's not defined. Huh? I can click on this and type in white. Okay. Click enter. Did you take it? Yes. Click enter and or go back. So now every dot I place on the map into uh, create a new item in my feature class will be written out as white inside a data table. All right, let's do this. Find a white car. Click on it. Why not going to delete right now? We're going to just simply add. If you have five more, don't worry about it. I want you to understand how this there's a different process is in create the data and show the data. Huh? So one white car. I'm on using a template, so every car I click now is white. Click, 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 click. Good enough. Now you're saying, damn it, Wurzer, you're telling me those are white cars? That Marker is black. Okay, remember lecture earlier today. We have an X, Y location, a coordinate, a point on the map. And we can color this whole thing and can symbolize it the way we want. I can put a pineapple on this location right now and say it's a car. Yeah? Right now, the color on your symbol on your marker does not correspond with the color coding inside your data table. The number 100 in your Excel spreadsheet does not tell you yet in the bar chart that it's going to be 100. Let's do it. 
simple exercise. Save. Yeah. Click on cars here on the side. Appearance, symbology, unique values. Uh, remember, there are different ways to add colorful stuff to our map. Unique values. Now it comes in and says, hey, inside your data table, we found something, the field color. Yeah. And now here you can specify which value should have what kind of symbol or color associated with it. Huh? There are different ways to do this. Add all values, add one specific one. Yeah. Let's do add all values. So what it does is it goes through your data table and takes a look at how many features you have and do they have different values. So as expected, we did this one dummy that has no value and we have a bunch of cars we defined as white. Now I can double click on this and say you're going to be just a circle. I can fill this here with different color and properties and all that. The book does step by step by step by step by step. I do jump, jump, jump right now. Huh? Double click this and I see now it's turned into a circle. All the cars in the background here are now symbolized with a circle. Huh? That's for white. All right. Let's do this one more step. X out. And I save this whole project up here. So, now if I go back here, I still have this create feature open. I can now click on white, find the next car. I'm faking this one. Click on it, and it stays white. Because right now, the data inside the table is associated with the symbology, what I will see on my map. Yeah? The dot and the pineapple. We literally could find a pineapple. We might. Yeah? Okay, there's a red car. What do I do with the red car? I could do a new template. Yeah? Let's say... <laughs> Every time now we're using this, I'm going to have red in there. Click on red. However, it didn't update yet the symbology because the system does not know yet about this. I have to save my edits so that inside the data table and I have to redo my edgy boots here. Wait. Let's do this with appearance and symbology, unique values, uh, add all or add the specific one. The specific one would be red. Do a big fat red one. Okay. And if I clear out, give me a moment here. This is a red one now. If I do these little steps in between, I finally I am at the point where my data entry through the template in my edit session, the moment I save my created data, oh, I gotta save it. I now able to visualize with symbology my data I just created. Again, you just experienced what we earlier learned in the theory lecture versus applied. Put a dot on the map. I see it is clicking with the templates. Huh? Put the dot on the map and then choose what kind of symbology you want. Like we did, the hospitals changed into bus stops. 
I can change the white into anything I want. If I want to be true with my data and produce the true information, I will have white, white, red, red. Huh? Okay. X out here. Zoom out a little bit. Um, oh, let's do this. Save the project. All right, let's do one more. Yeah, let's skip this. Let's do one more element. We have points, polylines, and polygons. Which one of the other two would you would like to would you like to do? Polygons. Some polygons like Chase already did. <laughs> Let's do polygons. All right. I go back to catalog. Clicking on my map layout GDP. Right click on it. Say new feature class. Again, shifts around a little bit, could be floating in front of you, could be on the side. I do encourage you, if you see this the first time, put it straight in front of you. Because huh? if it's tiny in the corner, you might not see everything. Yes, please. Yeah, what I did is, again, went back to my map layout, right click on it, say new feature class. And call it buildings. Again, just for practice, we're creating this as polygons. For practice, polygons is the default, but for practice, I am going to look at these options here. I select polygon. So you have that in your muscle memory. That is that one click. You have to open up this and make sure name type. Yeah. <coughs> Next, name, call it name as a name field. And click finish. Hey, I would like to do this. No, you're literally telling the mechanic, give me the tools when I do it. Not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, I think that's right. Ah. Yeah. Let me finish that. I'm getting an error message. If I yeah, go, if I start now doing delete, edit, all that, let me just do this. What's the error message? Well, it basically just told me when you ran error and didn't say what the error was and how it went to read your Refresh. Right. Okay, those who get an error message, go to your map layout GDP, right click on it and say refresh. Yeah, what does the error message say? Refresh. Sometimes there's a slack time in the uh, display. Name. Name. <coughs> Just name. You're doing okay?
Okay, did I create it? That's a good question. So I do this check up here. I'm in the map layout. I do refresh. I double click on it to make sure and I have buildings and cars. And you can see already cars is dots, points, different icon here, buildings. Right click on the buildings and I say add to the map I have open. For me right now it's map 2. So, and you can see it did load after a little bit of time. It load and I actually showed my uh, my internals here. Name shows up, but it's empty because we didn't create it yet. Okay. In a perfect world, I can see my car dots here, and I activate my buildings. Got to click on the layer you want to edit, huh? Because if you click on cars, you will create features in cars. Buildings. Go to edit. Open up the create panel if you haven't kept it open. And I'll put it here on the side. Pro loves us. Because in an edit session, it actually opens up all the templates that would be available. Yeah? So for buildings, I just can click on it. Yeah? There are different ways to deal with this. Create a polygon feature, different lines, how you deal with all these options. You could do just a rectangle. Well, if we want to do this with a rectangle, we might have a problem. By the way, navigation in the map, when you do edits, if I click now in it and would like to move the mouse, like I usually a map, like left click and move, a little bit complicated. I might just accidentally create points. The Z, the X and the Z. Zulu, X-Ray, Charlie. On your keyboard, uh, power tools. They can zoom in. You can see how it changes from plus and a minus. Yeah, actually picked up on mine already. And if I look at click the Z, Jolly. If I click on this, I get that hand. Yeah. With that key hold down, I can now left click and move anywhere I want using the mouse wheel in and out, and I can safely navigate without any <coughs> false data entry. Helps a lot. Keeps you insane. Uh, sorry, sane. All right. I don't want to do rectangle. I want to keep this irregular polygon. I want to do the Carl DeSantis building roof line in a very abstract way. I click here on the top corner. You can see the rubber line, rubber band following me. Click the other corner. And now you're doing a polygon. So now you can actually see it follows me to the next corner. And this corner as well. I double click to finish. And the moment it's finished, it will highlight again as the currently selected one. <coughs> Not very accurate, but right now I have a, a place called the DeSantis building, if I want to name that. Yeah? Everyone got something that looks like this? Doesn't have to be pretty. Could be a triangle. Would work too. Okay. <clears throat> Save. So what if, if I have done this and I didn't name it? There's a different way to add and change data. I can right click here on buildings, open up attribute table. And now you understand why I keep saying you gotta work with a large screen. Yeah? So now I have to, the map here this is in my table right now. This bluish color shows it's selected. I even can click on this. Simply, gently click on this and call this, let's say, just business, business school. 
and hit enter. Did you create? Did you create a field when you created? Did you put main field in your feature class when you created it? Yeah, but how do you add main? Like well, how do you add a new tab? Let me sh show you one more thing. So how about when you make that mistake, there's a step to go back and create it on the fly? Ah, yes. So let's assume. I look at this, I want to add the name business school for it. I right click here on buildings and say attribute table. Well, and pops up and I'm like, oh, damn it. The name field is not there. It's inside your data table. You're not going to create a new worksheet in Excel if you just have to change it in field. Yeah? So if everything is happy, I can go here to fields and say add a field. <laughs> Alright, let me finish this first, then we're done with the class and I can help you with this. So now I could call it for name, let's say name two, pull the data type up, text, yeah. We don't we only need one, and then say save. Yeah, so I accidentally even, because it's small stuff right now, added another field. Yeah. All right, so I X out on the fields, and I have my name too, and I can actually now call this business school. Does this answer your question? Uh, If your add a new field name is grayed out, this one here, this one here, there might be a reason for that. One reason might be this. You're actually digitizing, yeah, active digitizing edit session and you did not save your edits. If you go here and save, you writing temporary data as solid data into the system, and then save edits. Boom, it pops up. Huh? Open heart surgery. Got to close the patient first before you have tell him to walk. Yes. Technically, I shouldn't <laughs> talk like this, but I'm CFCPR training. So, okay. This is where I close right now. And look, close a few tabs to make this look a little bit more pretty. Yeah. And even switch off the world imagery to give you an idea what we have done. And again, if this is highlighted, yeah, in map, clear, de deselects everything for you. All right, quick summary of what we have done today. We did actually big milestones. Huh? We got challenged with data management that is needed if we find data from somewhere else. Huh? To get a little bit organized, we've just created a bucket that's good enough for right now. We found data, different locations. We explored how to unzip those and package them. Yeah? One, then we open up the data in different ways and edit it to edit it to the different map. Yeah? Add data directly or with folder connection. Then we went into geo databases and created feature classes for digitizing. Why? Because if we can't find the data and we're really 100% sure about what we're doing, we can create our data. Huh? On the examples for points, cars, we digitize cars. 
an associated a attribute of color for them and put the right symbology to it. Huh? Same thing then for buildings type polygon. Digitize them, create, show different ways of uh, how to manipulate the data table from a different angle. Yeah? And now I can do this with hundreds of fields and combinations of such. What we did not do is how to delete data or modify. One example to delete could be just select and press the delete button. Huh? Simple as that. Got to save it sometime. Go back to edit, got to save. Now, if I click yes, this thing is gone. Lucky for us, not all object undoes our existence. Open heart surgery. If you rip the heart out and throw it on the floor, patient is done. Huh? So be really careful. Lily, like, do not press that delete button in an edit session unless you know exactly this is that one feature I want to select and delete. That one, not 50 of them. Huh? One only. If you do edits, save occasionally in between. Huh? Why? Because if you do 50 points and you don't save the edits, 50 points are gone. Literally gone. All right. So one more thing. I close out Arc Pro, say yes to changes, save everything. Yeah. Close out this one. Go to my chess class folder. Yeah. And remember, we did this project called Map Layout. It does look the same way like the folders we created earlier today. Huh? On my machine, I select map layout with one single mouse click. Gesundheit. And I right click on it. Huh? What I want to do now is I want to compress this into a zip folder, into a zip file. Huh? Because, hey, I want to take this home with me huh? on a jump drive. On a jump drive, I can copy and paste this on your local machine. If I want to have you upload that zip file to, let's say, Canvas as a submission for something, this is how we're going to do this. On my computer here, I can say send to compressed zip folder. <clears throat> Left click on it and hit enter. Now it changes to compress zip folder and it shows me the zip file. On a WinZip or 7-zip machine, oh well, let's do this on yours. Yeah, send to Windows compressed folder. That folder. Click on the map. Right click. Send to perfect. Yeah. All right. Works fine on this left computer too. Send to Windows compressed folder. Again, I'll do this for the other one. Example here, click on it. Send to compressed folder. Ta-da! Now I can use this one. If your email allows it, like Gmail, you could send this via Gmail if needed. I think Nova email does not allow zip files anymore. You can Dropbox this whole thing. You can use Canvas and load it up. Why would you use Canvas as a zip? Well, if I look into the File Explorer here, look at all of these. This is my database. Do not do this at home. This is all your database, all the points and cars you digitize today. This is the internal stuff. Huh? Let the GIS system manage this for you. Don't play with it. All right? That all said? Send you information over the week, uh, next few days. Um, 
probably do the theory lecture for next week as a video so we have more time to play and click again give me a moment practice guys practice 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 no one, let's say after this session, no one should have troubles to open a zip folder file and move that into a project folder to do your work. No one should have a problem to add data. You might not be perfect with the purple and the pink on the screen, but you add the data. Huh? Simple basic elements, map layout, simple data creation. That's the takeaways from last week or this week. We also played around with a little bit online part. Huh? I can promise one thing. Quiz one, exam one, it's gonna be art bro pure like we did today. Huh? So please repeat. Do the do chapters in the syllabus. I can tell you already now who had at least an hour time between the last session and today who had zero time or who spent a little bit more than an hour. Just in the ease on the software and how you navigate around. Huh? Don't be shy to ask questions, but you gotta sit in front of the software at some point and do it. Huh? There's nothing more frustrating than to see you guys struggle, 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 and I can't help you. Well, you got to know a little bit where is what on the software. I know those ribbons are not easy to understand. But you learned during today, I explained something very slow, step by step. And the third or fifth time we repeat this is bing, bing, bing. Huh? Next week, two weeks, I just say, this is the location. We're going to add hospitals to the map. So the workflow and the steps are going to be very short descriptions. Huh? As in, okay, here are hospitals, map it out. All right, that's it for today.